All right, please turn with me to Ruth chapter 3, Ruth 3. Got a call from Dan yesterday and said, I don't think it's going to happen. So we just want to pray for he and his bride. These are both kind of under the weather and others in just a moment. We're looking at Ruth 3, verses 1 through 9. And um, this is the word of God. So let's read together. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you that it may be well with you? And now, is not Boaz our kinsman with whom the maids you were? Behold, he winnows barley at the threshing floor tonight. Wash yourself, therefore, and anoint yourself and put on your best clothes and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. And it shall be when he lies down that you shall notice the place where he lies and you shall go and uncover his feet and lie down and then he will tell you what you shall do. And she said to her, All that you say I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law had commanded her. When Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the feet of the heap of grain, and she came secretly and uncovered his feet and lay down. And it happened in the middle of the night that the man was startled and bent forward, and behold, a woman was lying at his feet. And he said, Who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your maid, so spread your covering over your maid, for you are a close relative. You may be thinking, where are we going with that today? So you can be praying for me as we pray together. Well, I so appreciate the opportunity to teach today. I so thank, uh, I don't thank Dan Duncan's sickness for it, but I so appreciate him. I hope you do too. He, week in and week out, the man is steady like all the elders and just preaches the word. He, I always, one thing I always say to him is that you won't leave one stone unturned. How many times have I gone and the, the preacher will kind of skip over the hard passages and he doesn't do that. So I'm so thankful for him. We are looking at Ruth today and we're going to see um, Ruth taking many risks. One in particular as we'll see. Uh, just by way of background, we have been studying the book of Ruth in our young adults class um, let me explain where we are in the book. Naomi is an Israelite woman. In the midst of a famine, Naomi and her husband Elimelech move out to Moab, where their sons, Malon and Kilion, marry Moabite women. Automatically, your mind ought to go, hey, that's probably not wise, and it's not. Well, sadly and regrettably, they stay in a foreign land, the land of Moab, instead of the promised land, and they stay there for 10 years. Now at the end of 10 years, Naomi is a widow. She's lost her husband, but not only that, she's lost both sons who are now dead. She's a bitter woman. As a matter of fact, when she gets back to the land of promise, land, uh, promised land, she tells people, call me Mara, which means bitter. Uh, Naomi means pleasant. She's no longer pleasant. She's a bitter, bitter woman. Although her one daughter-in-law named Orpah decides to stay in Moab, her other daughter-in-law won't leave her side. Literally, she clings to her. She won't leave. She's going to take care of her. And so what you're going to see first off at the very beginning of the book of Ruth is here is a young lady that ultimately risked it all. She risked and she, she sacrifices her future because she is going to love God and she's going to love this uh, mother-in-law that doesn't really seem to want her around. We'll see here that in the first two chapters, she forsakes a future Moabite husband. She's a Moabitess. She forsakes a future Moabite husband in order to move back to Israel uh, to stay by her mother's side. She forsakes her homeland. She's not an Israelite. She's a foreigner. She's going to forsake her own homeland to go to the promised land. And finally, she's going to forsake her family's gods. This is very clear when you read in the text. She's going to embrace the God of Israel. All right. So that's where we are. In the last chapter, um, Ruth has now obtained food. She's a hard worker, and she's gone out, and she's been gleaning in the field. And wouldn't you know it, it just happened, quote, unquote, the scriptures say, to be in the field of Boaz. In God's providence, that's exactly where he wants her to be, and that's where she goes. So now we see Ruth's mother-in-law is starting to maybe see the hand of God in these things. And so she's going to come up with a plan to get Ruth a husband. 
And I would, I would say at the very beginning, I don't think it's a good plan. And maybe you've never heard that before, and so I want to try to show that in the text. But ultimately, I want to show you that Ruth is a person of risk. She takes risks. You see, risk is when you combine obedience with faith. Ultimately, true faith has obedience. Uh, you see this in Hebrews 11. By faith, right? By faith, Noah built an ark. By faith, Abraham moved into a foreign land that was not his own. And by faith, Jacob is worshiping God and blessing his son. So by faith, all these guys were taking risks. When you take risks in life, you run the, the, just the gamut, the, the concerns that you're going to be mistreated. You're going to be uh, hurt. You're going to be rejected for the cause of Christ. But this is what we're called to. This is what indeed our Savior was called to, that he would... He, he would ultimately hand his life over to the Father, and he says, I will do whatever the Father says. Uh, so in some sense, there was no risk, because in the hand of God, it was all taken care of. But ultimately, Jesus Christ, is, he's going to be rejected and totally mistreated, and this is what the Scriptures call for us to be. I think we've forgotten that in these days in America, that we are not supposed to have a peacetime ethic, but a wartime ethic. We are not loved by the world, and that's okay. This is, neither was Christ. One other thing I'll explain before we go in the text is this concept of goel. Some of you that may be new, most of you is probably not. Goel is a Hebrew term, and it means redeemer, one who buys back. And there were redeemers in the Old Testament. What they were, they were guardians. They were benefactors. As a matter of fact, in a lot of ways, to put it in today's vernacular, they were kind of superheroes in Israel because they did primarily four things, and I'll list them to, for you. Number one, they, they buy back. That's what the name means, redeemer, one who buys back. And the first thing they buy back is they buy back a fellow Israelite out of slavery. Sadly, if you got sold into slavery, you hopefully had a redeemer who would come and he would buy you out of slavery. That was his role. That was his job. Secondly, what uh, Goel did, a redeemer did, is he bought back family land that had been sold because you were in debt. Uh, every, everybody owned their particular parcels of land because you were a particular tribe. But when you lost that land due to debt, you could sell it, but it's going to be yours again at the time of Jubilee. But even before then, you could have your Goel could come and buy the land back for you. The third thing a Goel did is he carries on the family name by, bearing, uh, by marrying a childless widow and having children through her. This is this concept of Leverite marriage that you've heard about it. Um, if my, if my, if, oh, I have an older brother. If he, if he were to die at the times of Israel, I would go in and I would marry his wife. And my, the firstborn son, the firstborn child, would be uh, basically named after my brother and the family line would continue on. So... He would, in some ways, he would buy back the family name. This guy's a superhero. The fourth thing, the last thing, is he would avenge the blood of a relative who had been murdered. If a person was murdered, uh, then the, peep, the, the goel would come and he would find that guy. They called him a blood avenger. If that doesn't sound like a superhero name, what does? And he, he would come and he would take out that guy. And so ultimately what he would be doing back at that time is he would be buying back that man's life. He couldn't bring the man back. He couldn't bring the woman back, but he would take out the person that killed them. So this Goel is a redeemer, one who buys back. If you're already thinking about Jesus Christ, then you know where I'm going today. Let's continue on. Verse 1, Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you, that it may be well with you? Literally what she says, I want to seek rest for you. Uh, how would you seek rest if you were a woman? Well, you, know, you would find rest in the home of a husband. He would protect you. Uh, they would have children. And that, so that one day, if you're an older widow, you've got children to take care of you once your husband is dead. And so she says, I'm going to find you a man. Now, this was normally done... Uh, in, for, with Ruth's parents, but Ruth's parents are either dead or they're, they're in Moab, and Ruth is gone out of Moab. So her mother-in-law is kind of taking on the role of a parent, and she said, I'm going to try to find you a husband. Now, I want you all to note this. What kind of prospective bride was Ruth? Guys, there are certain things that you would look for in a woman, that the person that you would marry. Let me tell you about Ruth's credentials. She's a foreigner. She's a widow. 
She's poor, and in all likelihood, she's infertile because she had been married 10 years or at least several years to a man that they never had kids. Not a very good perspective, you would say. As a matter of fact, ain't nowhere in the book of Ruth is she described as an attractive lady. She may have been, but we don't know that from the text. Verse 2, just the first part. Now, is not Boaz our kinsman with whose maidens you were? So here Naomi is mentioning where Ruth has been gleaning for the last several months. Naomi is trying to find Ruth a husband, and she says, Hey, by the way, that field, remember that guy, the owner? His name was Boaz. What about Boaz? Have you considered Boaz? Right? And so let's continue on the rest of that verse and then into verse 3. Behold, he winnows barley at the threshing floor tonight. Wash yourself, therefore, and anoint yourself, and put on your best clothes, and go to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known. I want you all to note that, known. That, that will mean something here in just a moment. Don't make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. So I could probably look around here, and I'm thinking not many of you all have winnowed barley before. Right? That's a pretty good guess. I know I haven't, but I looked up the process because I'm just curious. What you would do is you would gather all the grain, and the second thing you would do is you would thresh the grain by using a really large stick, or you would have the oxen tread out the grain. What you're doing ultimately is you're taking these barley stalks, and you're removing the husk from the barley. Um, the closest thing we can get to it with y'all is, you know when you eat peanuts at a restaurant, you take the husk off, all right? This is this concept. So the person is at this point separating the grain from the husk. Finally, you would winnow it. What you would do is you would take that barley and you would throw it up in the air and you would take the remaining chaff. The chaff is like the husk material that's still connected to it and, and it would be blown away by the wind. Thus, and you see in the New Testament that the chaff are the wicked and they will be blown away. To the ancient Israelites, they would know exactly what that meant. So this would happen. And so what you would do at that point is you would now have heaps of grain after you've winnowed the barley, and you'd store it, or you would just sell it right then. So she tells her, why don't you go and wash yourself? Which is not the most romantic thing to say. Uh, you might be thinking, does Ruth normally not wash herself? Well, remember the ancients didn't bathe near as much as we do. And so she's saying, hey, go back there, wash yourself, anoint yourself. That's, that means it's some sort of perfume or something that would make you smell really good. Basically, she says, I want you to get all gussied up. And, and that's what she does. And she says, and, and put yourself in, an, in a nice, uh, or basically your best clothes. Actually, in the, in the Hebrew, it's put on your cloak. But this concept of put on you know, what you got best. And remember, they're poor, so that would be as best as they could get. And go down to the threshing floor. Once again, threshing floors were in areas that uh, would be windy. So you would have them on the eastern side of an Israelite city. The weather patterns in Israel go from the Mediterranean, from the west to the east. And so you'd have it on the eastern side of town. And so she says, just go down there. Sometimes, sometimes they were up on a hill, these sort of threshing or winnowing floors. Sometimes they were down below. And, and this one is down below, it seems. So she says, go down there. In verse 4. It shall be when he lies down that you shall notice the place where he lies, and you shall go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what you shall do. So the concept is Ruth, get dressed up, get all cleaned up, smell good. I want you to sneak up there and see where he's sleeping, then later go over and uncover his feet. Strange. Never happened in my dating life, maybe not yours either. What does this uncover your feet mean? Well, first off, the Hebrew word uh, mar it is margalot. It doesn't necessarily mean feet. Um, in Daniel 10.6, there's this word used again, and, and it refers to the region of the legs. Uh, Daniel saw a vision of a man, and it says, his arms and margalot, his arms and, and legs, were like the gleam of burnished bronze. So Ruth is... is what custom is this? And by the way, the last thing to do is once you've removed his cloak from his feet or his legs, then lie down. Well, this seems to be one of two things. It could be a symbolic ancient gesture that we don't know anything about that invites Boaz to take her as his wife. Or could it be something much more nefarious than that? Now, 
I'm not going to try to ruin your view of Ruth because I think she's a godly woman. I'll tell you right now. But I think it's worth looking into because what you're going to find out, I don't think Naomi is giving her wise counsel. And Boaz will allude to this later. Verse 5 and 6. Ruth says to her, All that you say I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law had commanded her. Note how Ruth is so quick to submit to her mother-in-law, under whose authority she places herself. It reminds me in Joshua 1.16, as the people were going into the land of Israel, and they look at Joshua and said, All that you have commanded us, we will do. Wherever you send us, we will go. Can you imagine if we had that sort of submission to Jesus Christ in our day-to-day lives? Wow. What would this church look like if we were just quick to submit to Christ? You, you probably haven't heard this before. It's not normally seen as a really great compliment, but when was the last time somebody looked at you and said, you know, I really like you. You're a very submissive person. You would go, that's not a compliment, right? Especially men, perhaps, would say that. But ultimately, the most submissive person in the history of the world is Jesus Christ, who submitted to his Father in all things, right? So she says, I'm going to do whatever you say to do. Verse 7, when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain, and she came secretly and uncovered his feet and lay down. So what does that mean, his heart was merry? Well, I don't think it's drunkenness. Uh, And some people have commentated on that, said, I think Boaz has had a great time and he's drunk at the end of the of the barley heap. Uh, I don't think so because that, there's no indication that Ruth and Boaz are those sort of people. They're not drunk. At the same time, Psalm 104, verse 15 says, God makes wine to gladden the heart of man. Um, I don't think he's drinking grape juice either. It's, it's clear in the text that he's, he's finished with all the winnowing. It's the end of harvest. So he had a huge meal. He's had a glass or two of wine, perhaps. It's a time of celebration. He's not drunk. Drunkenness is always wrong. And he's sleepy. And he's lying down. And he's at the end of the heap of grain. And here's the way it would work. The reason why you slept with the grain is you don't want somebody to come and steal it. You've worked too hard. And so he's laying right there. And so what does she do? She comes up and she uncovers his feet. Or maybe it was his legs. But I would say this, once again, there's nothing in the context that Ruth is doing something sinful here. Yet I will tell you this, there's something immorally charged about this atmosphere. Very immorally charged. Let me show you. First off, uh, remember Naomi tells Ruth, I want you to go lie down. This term lie, L-I-E, when you see in the Old Testament, it's normally referring to illicit relations. When Potiphar's wife grabs Joseph and she says, what? Come lie with me. It's this picture of of illicit relations most times. Notice this also as she said, Naomi said to Ruth earlier, she goes, don't make yourself known to the man. And, And we think of that term as meaning like he doesn't realize you're there. And that's probably the case. But there's also when you see the word no in the Old Testament, you see it even in Genesis that Adam knew his wife and she conceived. So it's not just those two phrases that gives you the idea that there's something, there's something that could be very immoral about this. As a matter of fact, if I were to read this in Hebrew to the ancient Israelite, at this point, you're very uncomfortable in the text. Very uncomfortable. Because note this, it's under veil of night. Ruth looks very good. She smells good. Boaz has been drinking. No one is around. What will they do? Why is this here? Well, first off, it's because it's written by the Spirit. And secondly, I think it's for the the place of of a fact. The Spirit wants to show you this. What's going to happen? It's driving home the point that God's people are confronted with sinful temptations all the time. Right? So so will Ruth and Boaz be guided by self-interest? Or are they going to be guided by God's interest? Are they going to be here in the middle of the night... Are they going to give way to the lust of the flesh or the glory of God? I like what Bob Deffenbaugh had written about this. He he is a uh, pastor at actually a community Bible chapel for many years. Uh, He talks about five reasons why Naomi's proposition is pragmatic and patently wrong. 
for the following reasons. Number one, Naomi proposes to solve a problem in secret that should have been dealt with in public. Question, is the solution to Ruth's situation best handled in the bed of Boaz in the middle of the night? No, this is something that should, be, should have been done publicly. And by the way, it was done publicly later on where this has all worked out. But she's like, no, do this in the middle of the night. Secondly, Ruth's proposition is godless. In her advice to Ruth, there's not one word of reference to God. Not one. From Naomi's words, we would conclude that Ruth's security is best attained by finding a husband, not by placing her trust in the Lord. By the way, some of you can relate to this. No, my guess, all of you can relate to this. Where you sought to find your rest, your security, in the stuff of this earth, right? I know me, I was in college, and uh, to speak funny here, I went pre-wed in college. The idea is I wanted to find a wife. That's, that's the job. You know, finish the degree and get married. That's just the way it was supposed to go. I'm so glad God in his kindness gave me Rebecca years later because I was certainly not ready for her in college. And I think she was about age 10 anyway or something. No, I'm kidding. It's not that much difference between us. Um, Maybe some of you may try to find your significance. If, if only God would give me a child, there will be my rest. There will be my security. For those, that are, for those that are in jobs, if only I could get a different job. If only I could have this new car. If only. And our rest and security are found outside of Jesus Christ. So Naomi's proposition is godless. She's trying to find a rest and security outside of the Lord here. Number three, Naomi's plan seeks to appeal to the baser instincts and impulses of Boaz, not his higher sense of duty. I mean, note this again. Wine, the dark of night, an undercover encounter. Naomi's proposition did not appeal to one's moral high ground at all. It did not encourage Boaz to do the right thing in the right way. Instead, it urged Ruth to seek a husband in a questionable in compromising manner. Fortunately, Boaz was committed to do the right thing in the right way. So what she's doing here is basically, once again, it is appeals to the baser instincts. I'm going to give you biblical reference for this. So you won't think I'm just making this up. Number four, Naomi's scheme needlessly put the reputation of two godly people at risk. Uh, let me show you chapter 3, verse 14, Boaz's words. Boaz shows this to be the case. And I know we're not going to speak about this today, but I'm just mentioning it as proof here. So she lay, meaning Ruth lay at his feet until morning and rose before one could recognize one another. And he said, let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. So he tells her, Ruth, you need to get out while it's dark. If you get out of here in the morning light, people are going to think there's something wrong. Doesn't the Bible speak about this? Don't let there be a hint of sexual immorality about you. So... Naomi's scheme put them at really in a bad spot. Two godly people would have been the subject of gossip as though they had acted improperly. Note this. It was Naomi's plan that put Ruth and Boaz in the same place, even the same bed in the middle of the night, with workers perhaps not far away. And finally, number five, the reason why this is pure pragmatism and not a good plan, Naomi's plan seemed to assume the end justifies the means. The goal was a good one, to secure a husband for Ruth. Indeed, this will eventually occur in chapter 4, but her way of bringing this to pass is vastly different than the way Boaz chooses to accomplish this. Overall, Naomi is doing what is right in her own eyes. This is, this is the book of Judges all over again. What are we kidding ourselves? This is American churches all over again. We do what is right in our own eyes many times in the American church. The end justifies the means, right? It's wrong. It's wrong. Ruth doesn't do anything wrong here. As a matter of fact, the way Ruth and Boaz handle it is really spot on. Verse 8, let's continue on. It happened in the middle of the night that the man was startled and bent forward, and behold, a woman was lying at his feet. The word startled, it literally means trembled. Uh, there's two reasons why. Number one, he's cold. You're cold in the middle of the night, and you... So you're kind of trembling. That's not probably the case. I think he trembles for the same fact that you and I would tremble, guys. There was a woman at the bottom, at, near our feet. What is this? What in the world? And so, um, so and it says, Hine, the Hebrew Hine, it means behold, 
Whenever you see the word behold in Scripture, it's, it's a, basically it's a Hebrew uh, idea that, that confirms this idea that the term invites the readers to experience the scene through the eyes of the person. Um, if you're into old Alfred Hitchcock movies, he does the same thing. Um, they call it, it's a concept that's related to pure cinema. Pure cinema meaning when, when the TV, rather when the movies went from silent films uh, to sound, uh, there's a lot of people that didn't like that because they said, ugh, we're, not, we're focusing now on sound instead of sight. And pure cinema tried to bring that back. And Alfred Hitchcock does that in his movies. What, what he does is that in his films, the camera kind of takes on a, a human-like uh, concept that, that it kind of roams the room and then it focuses on something. You've seen perhaps one of the movies. You know what I'm speaking of. It tells a story just by pointing to a particular item. And so this is what happens with Boaz. Behold! And then the camera spans a woman at the end of his feet. Huh? He said, Who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your maid. Now, he wants something we don't see in the English. He uses the feminine word here in Hebrew that makes it clear that he knows there's a woman at the end of his feet when he says, who, who are you? So basically, in some ways, we would say, it, who are you, woman? He knows it's a girl. And she refers to it, I am your maid. In chapter 2, verse 13, when Ruth first meets Boab, she calls herself a shifka. Shifka, meaning slave girl. Slave girls don't marry... Uh, highfalutin uh, property owners like Boaz. But here she doesn't call herself a shifka. She calls herself an ana. An ana, meaning a uh, maidservant. Maidservants could marry these sort of rich, powerful men. She's saying basically, I'm marriageable here. And note what else she says, verse 9. So spread your co covering over your servant, for you are a close relative. <laughs> What it says in another text, for you are a redeemer. You are a goel. And so what she's saying is she said, I need for you to, I'm asking for you to do something for me. I'm asking for you to spread your covering over me. Also, it could be translated, I'm asking for you to spread your wings over me. The way an eagle will do with its eaglets. Is that what we call them? I'm not sure. But that's what, that's what you have here is he, He's saying, she's saying, spread your wings over me. Spread your covering over me. We see this. Actually, this is what God does with us. Ezekiel 16.8, it shows God metaphorically spreading his wing over naked Jerusalem. The believers of that time, Israel, if you will, as an act of protection and a precursor to marriage. In Ruth 2.12, Boaz actually compliments Ruth. He hears about Ruth and he's like, man. What kind of person are you that you would actually move from Moab to take care of your mother-in-law who can't give you anything? And he says this. He says, The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, catch this, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. You've gone underneath the Lord's wings. This is the same term here. You know, even in the Middle East today, a part of many ceremonies for the bridegroom, you know what he does? He takes, he takes a silk or cotton robe and he puts it around his bride. Isn't that a sweet picture? And that's, this is a picture of what God does with us. He brings us to himself and he protects us. And so she's looking at Boaz and says, can you, can you cover me? And, and a matter of fact, it, it, she changes up the script, right? And in chapter 3, verse 4, something we just read, what was Ruth supposed to say? Answer, nothing. Just go there, cover of night, at his feet, he'll tell you what to do. That's not what she does here. She talks about it, and she says, spread your wings over me. And notice she says, you are a close relative. You are a Goel. By calling him Goel, basically, she's, it's true. She's asking him to marry her. But no, it's not just asking him to marry her. She's saying, would you be a provider for my mother-in-law? Would you carry on my father-in-law's family name? Because that's what he is going to do. You see, Ruth hoped Boaz was the closest living relatives of her dead husband, Malon. We'll find out later if you were to keep reading the book of Boaz, uh, Boaz sorry, change the name, 
Keep reading the book of Ruth that Boaz is not the closest relative. But we're not there today. The Net Bible translates as this way, marry your servant, for you are a guardian of the family's interest. You are a goel. So what do you have here Ruth doing? You have her risking once again. Think about it like this. What if Boaz had looked down on her and said, who are you? I am Ruth. Spread your covering over me. And he looks and he goes, get out of my bed. Right? He certainly could have said that. He could have said, leave. I just, I just let you glean in my field. That's all I did. I didn't say I'd marry you. But we see Ruth once again risking. The risk that she's already taken, once again, she's forsaken the Moabite husband, future Moabite husband, by clinging to her mother-in-law. She forsakes her homeland by moving to Israel. She forsakes her family's gods by embracing the God of Israel. Let me give us a long conclusion. I'm going to speak to believers and unbelievers in here to do, as Dan so faithfully does week in and week out. If you're a believer, you may not know this, but you are called to a life of risk. As I said, I think Revelation, or rather Hebrews 11, defines risk very well. When you're combining faith with obedience, true faith does produce works. Now, we're not... We're not going to be fruit inspectors. That's not our job. That's the Lord's job. But ultimately, true faith, as Calvin talks about, it it produces works. It happens. So as a believer, what are you risking? What are you risking when you risk, when you choose to follow the Lord? Not just just a mental ascent to the things of Christ, but you're going to follow Him, right? Well, you, you risk rejection, bodily harm, the disadvantageous life. This is what all the people did in Hebrews 11, so many of us, and I I firmly include myself in this group, are so lily-livered. Do we still use that term? Lily-livered. You know where that comes from? I just looked it up the other day, so I I have to share it with you. Um, It was first used in 1605. It's a medieval belief that the liver was where courage came from. The lily is a pale color, as you know, and a person who has no blood in their liver would have no courage. He was a coward. He was lily-livered, right? And as a believer in Jesus Christ, we ought, about, we ought to all be about risk. Because ultimately, what are we risking? Nothing but our physical bodies, our lives. We're, not, we're going to get them back anyway one day, right? Jesus Christ calls us to that, and ultimately... He was rejected for us. He went through death for us. He lived a disadvantageous life for us. And by the way, you see that in Hebrews 12, don't you? Why does does Jesus do this for us? Why does he call us in the same paths to take risks in the sense of, of chances of bodily harm and hurt and danger to follow him? Well, what's it say? Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy, aha, who for the joy set before him, denied the, rather endured the cross, denying the shame, and has sat down, sat down at the right home of the throne of God. Y'all, the reason why he did it was the joy that was set before him. The reason why we don't take risk in this life, the reason why we don't serve the way we should, the reason why we don't love the way we should, the reason why we don't make disciples the way we should, Let's be honest, we're scared. We're scared of this life, but ultimately Jesus had his focus on the next, the joy said before him. So let me put some hands and feet on this if you're a believer today. Here's a group that we are called to practice a lifestyle of risk. And once again, what I mean by risk is just combining obedience with faith. Unbelievers. Unbelievers. What are we called to do with unbelievers? Well, we're called to love them. Great commandment, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. When was the last time you went outside of yourself to go speak to somebody who looked totally and completely opposed to Christianity? Because that's the same exact person that Jesus went after. When was the last time you went after somebody that is really considered in your mind so sexually deviant? It turns your stomach. Those were called the prostitutes at the time of Christ, who he went after. 
When was the last time you went after somebody that is so completely un-American, right? Wants nothing to do, and you know, it's just kind of a rabble rouser. He's not a good citizen at all. These are called the tax collectors in the first century. These are whom we're called to go after. Uh, not just to go after and give them love, but to do what? Give them the gospel, right? Make disciples of all nations. Uh, too many times we don't, we don't do that. As a matter of fact, the people that we go after typically don't look at all like um, the people that Jesus Christ went after. Unbeliever. Now, before we do that, let me tell you real quickly a story. I was in Denton on Friday seeing an old buddy of mine, a college friend, and doing some, just some Ph.D. work at the library. And uh, We went out to eat downtown Denton Square, if you've been there, it's so pretty. And we were just talking, and I said, his name is Joe. And I said, Joe, look back at college. We were both believers. Do you, do you have regrets? And he said, yes. I mean, so many times, and we both agreed. We just said, you know, there's so many times we knew so much of the Bible. We just didn't do it. You know, just regrets of just not making disciples, not, not pouring our lives into others like we should have, right? And then our waitress came up, and she kept taking an order, and she was so nice. And as he was talking about it, both of us, I think, felt very convicted about this. We're talking about regret, and God has given us a really kind waitress, that, and it's not much going on at the restaurant. So we asked her her name, and she said, what are you all doing here? I said, well, I don't live in Denton, just, you know, working on some work here at the PhD. Oh, really? Tell me, tell me about that. So I did, and I said, well, we go to church in two different areas. Oh, that's, that's great. I said, where do you go to church? And she told me, and I said, you know, what is... Let me ask you something. What does your church teach about how a person is right with God? It wasn't mean-spirited. It just basically, I wanted to know, what is she basing her eternal salvation on, right? And she said, well, I mean, I think it's the idea that you love God and you, you do the best you can and follow Him and you, you believe in Him. You trust Him as your Savior. And I said, well, <laughs> she was just, you know, kind of scatter shooting many times when we talk to people about the gospel. That's kind of their answer, just... Just do whatever, you know. And so I said, you know, can I tell you the best news I've ever heard? Sure. So literally in just a, just a two-minute fashion, I was able to give her the gospel that, you know, we are sinners. God made us to glorify Him, and we don't. We glorify ourselves. And not only do we glorify ourselves, but that sin leads to death. Romans 6.23, the payment for sin, the wages for sin is death. I said, okay, you're going to die in your sins, and you're going to go to hell. And so will I without God doing something. To save us. And that's why he sent his son, Jesus Christ. And that's probably why you said something the effect of believing in him. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we began to talk a little bit about that. I said he was the perfect salvation, right? He lived the perfect life you and I could never live. God demonstrates his own love towards us. And while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. I said, that's not enough. A lot of people believe that. That makes them believers in Christmas and Easter. I said, you have to come to the place you're trusting in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. And so I really encouraged her in that fashion. And my, my friend gave her uh, the phone number, the address of the church, and, and his email as well. And so I just, I fail so many times in making disciples, terribly. I just want to give you all some encouragement in that, that we need to take risks in that. And I, by God's grace alone, it, I was able to do that with a friend of mine. Unbeliever, let me talk to you quickly. I encourage you. To come under the wings of your Redeemer, the Redeemer. He's the Goel of His people. I told you all at the beginning the four things that the Goel does. Number one, He buys back a fellow Israelite out of slavery. Let me tell you what the Great Shepherd, our Redeemer, the Goel, did for us. He bought us back from the slavery of sin and death. That's what He did. Number two, uh, the ancient Israelite Goel, He would buy back family land that had been sold due to debt. Folks, our debt with sin can never be repaid. And so God in His kindness didn't just buy family land. He bought the whole earth back for us, right? New heavens and new earth that we will be in someday. He bought it back for us. The, the land that we lost in Adam is now given back to us one day. Number three, the ancient Israelite Goel, he buys back the family name by marrying a childless widow and having children through her. But Jesus Christ much better than that. Christ carried on the human family name by marrying us 
Basically, in a sense, we were childless widows, but not exactly. You see, the only children we bore was a two-headed monster called sin and death. That's the only children that we could bear. And yet when he saves a person, he gives them the Holy Spirit so that they can bear children in the sense of bear fruit of a righteous life. This is what he calls us to. This is what the risk-taking is about. And finally, number four, he buys back that man's life. You see, uh, the ancient Israelite Goel, he would avenge the blood of a relative who had been murdered. You see, Adam was murdered, but note this. Adam was actually committing suicide, he and Eve in the garden, by eating of the fruit, right? So they, in some ways, murdered themselves, and at that point, they were not innocent. They were guilty. But Jesus Christ, the second Adam, buys back some from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation from the line of Adam by laying down his own life for us. Unbeliever, listen to me today. Is Jesus Christ your goel? Are you one of those who has been bought back? Turn from your sin today. Repent of, tr repent of your good works that will never save you and embrace the Goel, the great redeemer of mankind. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for this, this story. Thank you so much for the Goel, the great Goel, Jesus Christ, who would gladly buy back what we have wasted our own lives, Father, even as believers, so much of it have been wasted on ourselves. And I pray, Father, that you would light in us a fire, that we would long to take risks for the kingdom. We would long to love. We would long to make disciples. This is only the result of your good work in our lives. We thank you for the spirit that makes all these things possible. In the name of Jesus Christ, the great Goel, we pray. Amen.